So our next speaker is one of the OGs of immunotherapy. Do you guys know what OG means? Original gangster. It's like a rapper, an old school rapper. He means old timer. <laughs> uh, Mario Snow, who's a professor of medicine and medical oncology and the president of the Society for Immunotherapy of Cancer. Um, and um, he is going to be our anchor. Thank you, Mario. No, I'll ask a question for Li Ping now before I start. <laughs> so, still here, still here. So, Li Ping, I want to know for critical and non redundant pathways, would you expect a phenotype in a mouse model? Like, for example, you know, with, with anti PD1, even though it doesn't have much of a phenotype, if they're more prone to autoimmunity, with CTLA4, they die of lymphoproliferation. So, for a critical pathway like Cyclid 15, does it have? Uh, a phenotype, like if you induce autoimmunity, are they more prone to autoimmunity in the animal models? Uh, autoimmune is still study, actually. I'm uh, quite surprised. And, and I, 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 have not, I, I cannot tell you now. I mean, it's a very confusing data right now come up in terms of autoimmunity. But in terms of uh, uh, analysis of the uh, different pathways, I think it's a, you know, mouse model is, I actually less trust mouse model mm. in terms of, uh, of the heterogeneity because mouse model tended to be not, much less heterogenic, mm. not as a human. Human can be, for example, human can be multi, uh, the, the mechanism or pathway displayed simultaneously, mm. or come up one by one. But in mouse model, usually much more homogeneous. Mm. Means one state forever, okay? And, but tell the truth is, until now, we still don't have any mouse model which actually naturally or spontaneously express sequel 15, for example. Mm. But in humans, a lot. Right? But in mouse, we don't really see that. You don't see it. So you can see that the, this is a you know, kind of awkward situation. Right? Okay. Thank you. <laughs> to my question. <laughs> thanks, Lee Ping. So uh, thanks to the organizers for the invitation. I, I stand between you and the weekend. Um, the, um, um, when, the, when I was asked to, to give this talk, uh, uh, four or five or six months ago, I thought, oh, by then I would have something new to present. But <laughs> uh, the answer is not really. And uh, that goes to show to some degree um, maybe that the field is moving a little bit slowly, at least in terms of clinical application. Um, so um, I'm just going to try and address, just show that these three questions are very hard. I mean, the, the big question for me now is um, who does and who does respond to anti PD1? Um, what are the mechanisms for non-response? Um, is there anything that we can do about that? Uh, and can we identify those patients in which we can do something about the, the mechanisms of non-response? And I'm going to try and, and, and indicate how difficult I think this is um, over the next uh, few slides. So um, by now, by the end of the day, you've already seen all my slides. Um, one piece of advice for any clinical investigator is always be the first one to talk at a meeting because at least by then, none of no one has shown your slides at that point. But um, this is the data for um, for the five-year follow-up for anti-PD-1 for the the second trial of anti-PD-1 in the clinic. Um, we dose the first patient here, and in November of 2008, there's 10-year follow-up. Suzanne Tupalian did most of the heavy lifting on on this five-year, um, or actually less follow-up, which has uh, at least five years of follow-up in all patients. And it shows that the five-year survival rate in melanoma is 34%. I just want to point out how important that is that the, um, uh, with prior to the era of the checkpoint inhibitors, that five-year survival rate would have been around 5%. And um, even with anti-CTLA-4, the five-year survival rate is only in the 15 to 20%. So anti-PD-1 at least doubles and maybe triples the uh, survival rate for melanoma at five years. But if it was only in melanoma, None of us would be here because melanoma is a rare disease and nobody would really care. And what really got people interested in the field is really the fact that the survival curve in non-small cell lung cancer, which is unprecedented also, because lung cancer is a big market, people became interested in, in, in this field. And again, that, that's actually, at least for the time, an unprecedented survival curve, I think, in non-small cell lung cancer. By the way, Scott Gettinger here, and I'm going to be a little Yale-centric in the talk, accrued most uh, a good... Uh, probably the largest number of lung cancer patients in that, uh, in that trial. Um, so uh, Drew showed a, a slide like this uh, earlier. This is my version of it, um, showing that from that very first trial of anti-PD-1, uh, a number of other anti-PD-1 and anti-PD-L1 agents were developed. 
and the list on the left, which I have to change almost with every uh, talk that I give, are the number of tumors for which anti-PD-1 or anti-PD-01 has been approved either alone or a combination. It's really uh, remarkable. There's a number of other tumors for which there's clear activity but just hasn't been approved yet. And in fact, we now talk about tumors unlike the old days where we talked about tumors where the immunotherapy was active, the one or two tumors. Now we talk about the one or two tumors where it's not active. But the problem is, is that despite uh, being active in all these diseases, it's only active in a subset. And if you've heard before, what's critical is trying to identify who is and who isn't a responder and why they don't uh, respond. So um, you've heard already about biomarkers here. Clinically, really, there's only three that we use, pd one We don't use the other ones. We don't use uh, uh, interferon gamma gene signature, although it's probably could be useful. You would think that assessment of T cells in the tumor microenvironment would be the best biomarker, right? You shouldn't respond unless you have T cells in the microenvironment. And the other one, which is a surrogate for having an antigen-specific T cell response, would be high tumor mutation burden. And the surrogate for that would be uh, DNA mismatch repair. And those are really the, bio the main biomarkers that have gained traction um, since uh, the initiation of these trials. Um, just to drill down on the T cell response, um, it, it does seem to associate with, uh, with activity for anti-PD-1, but there's a number of things that have been looked at, and it, nothing has really sort of um, uh, stuck right at this point. So you can look at the number of CD8 T cells at the tumor invasive margin. You can look at the number of stromal CD8 cells. You can look at the clonality of the T cells, all those associate. People have looked at subsets of T cells within the tumor microenvironment. Um, Adil Dowd has looked at CTLA-4, PD-1, uh, double positive cells. And more recently, especially with the single cell RNA-seq sequences, it's become clear that perhaps maybe some subset of T cells are the ones that correlate. So not all the CD8 T cells are important, only a subset perhaps contribute to the anti-tumor response. And David and others here have started to look at functionality of those T cells. And that can also, to some degree, correlate with, uh, with response to anti-PD-1. But it gets really complicated. Um, and I just want to point out, and I can't say that I understand any of these papers. There are at least four papers out there now on single cell sequencing of T cells in the microenvironment, either before or before and after anti-PD-1. And I think what, what the, the main message for this is that there's clearly a subset of cells, probably early memory or stem cell memory-like cells, that probably contribute the most to the response. Um, you can identify those by markers, and I think this will create an opportunity for start looking for different signals that might really activate different subsets of T cells. What's really sort of scary is the last paper seemed to suggest that you needed um, T cells to come from outside the tumor microenvironment in order to get the response, that some of those clones that are there after treatment weren't there before. They probably come from the lymph node or some other place, and if that's the case, then maybe all the information actually isn't within the tumor microenvironment itself. Um, but um, you can't start using this sort of information, all of this information, at least the simple information, to start trying to identify who would and who wouldn't respond. At least you can enrich to some degree who would respond to anti-PD-1 or anti-PD-01. And you can do that by maybe combining two biomarkers at the same time. And people, especially Merck, has started to look at this and look at, for example, TMB on one axis and PD-01 expression on the other or interferon gamma expression on one, uh, ex on, uh, expression on one axis and, uh, and TMB on the other axis, and you can divide it up into quadrants, and it seems to suggest that if you have both markers positive, high TMB, high pd one or high interferon gamma gene signature, you tend to have the highest chance for response. If you have one or the other positive, you have some chance of responding. If you have neither, you have a very low chance for response. So this is important because it starts to tell us who is and who isn't likely to respond to anti-PD-1, even if you can't identify all the responders and non-responders with these assays. But what it gets to, and the point that I'm going to ultimately make, is that it doesn't really tell you what you need to do for the non-responders in order to move the field forward. It just tells you who might or might not respond to this one drug, but not what you need to add or give to the non-responders in order to get a clinical effect. So one way to sort of start to think about that is to look at what the actual mechanisms are of non-response. And you've sort of heard this from Li Ping. This is a different way of, of, of looking at this. You can imagine that there's a group of patients for which there are no T cells in the microenvironment. That would be Li Ping's double negative group. And there are more than one reason why that might be the case. Uh, it could be no priming, or it could be signals that exclude uh, T cells from the microenvironment. But even then, there's a deeper layer, which is what are the mechanisms that, that drive that. There's probably a group of patients for which um, 
there's a lack of agonist signals, the T cells are there, but, but, but they don't have enough agonist signals, or perhaps there are other inhibitory signals, for example, the Siglet 15. And then there's probably a group of patients for which they're not responsive to T cells at all because they've lost class one or beta-2 microglobulin, if you've heard from, from Katie earlier. And as I've looked through the literature, you can find all of these mechanisms. And as you look through these mechanisms carefully, you see that possibly some can be addressed, but maybe some cannot, and that's, that's a real problem. What's even harder is whether you can actually sort of assess these before you treat a patient, figure out what the right mechanism is, and then give them the right drug with or without anti-PD-1 in order to get activity. So what that's led to is this huge number of clinical trials, um, all based on really decent animal models, all of which show some positive effect. And that you can divide them up into two kinds of trials. Those, and, and, and Li Ping sort of pointed this out also, those that provide some sort of agonist signal. They either give, you either give cytokines or you give TIL cells or you give, try and induce an immune response um, or you give co-stimulatory signals. And then there's the other uh, sort of way of looking at it, which is to try and block negative regulatory elements within the tumor microenvironment. And there's a bunch of them. And the real question is, are some of these dominant? Uh, how do you identify which ones are dominant? But that hasn't stopped the development of multiple clinical trials. And you can imagine that um, if you go into a clinical trial of 100 patients in a disease, and maybe multiple mechanisms are responsible for resistance, and you're only doing one combination, you may only identify uh, response in a small number of patients, that that signal may not be enough to drive development of that combination forward or that agent forward. So this creates a real clinical problem in that the, having that biomarker to tell you which agent to add or which agent to give when the mechanism that's relevant is only present in a small subset of set patients is really critical for development. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time on just one combination, actually three combinations, to sort of show you what the clinical conundrum is, how difficult this is. So um, back in 2009, we actually treated the first patient here with ipilimumab and nivolumab, and it really made sense to give that combination. Not only did it make biological sense, but it was, they were the only two agents that were available at the time. So we didn't have to think hard about <laughs> trying to combine those two agents. And we were surprised not only at the level of activity, but at the level of toxicity of those two drugs. And what I'm showing you here is the uh, five-year follow-up. This was a phase one trial in melanoma. And the five-year survival now for melanoma using ipilimumab nivolumab combinations is in the range of 50%. This is our phase one trial data, which was 94 patients. But it's really remarkable, and it's probably better than anti-PD-1, although um, I'll show you in a minute, in randomized trials, it wasn't that straightforward. And Madhav Dadabkar and Kavita Dadabkar, who were here at the time, took samples that we collected in those trials, and they did all sorts of studies. And really, anti-CTLA-4 and anti-PD-1 did what you wanted it to do. It, it, if you looked at gene expression in T cells and monocytes in the peripheral blood, you got a whole net subset of genes. This is shown here, um, uh, both in the, the first, I guess I need a... Um, a point, well, it doesn't matter. The B, the first set of slides there, really shows that in T cells you get a whole set of genes that are upregulated by the combination that you don't see with either agent alone. That's also true in monocytes. And if you look at cytokines that are induced in the peripheral blood, for the ones that were looked at, these were the ones where you saw a major effect. You saw an increase in CXCL10. Theoretically, downstream of interferon gamma, you saw an increase in soluble IL-2 receptor, which means you got more T cell activation, and you got IL-1-alpha, which I'm not sure exactly where that came from. But in any event, you got clear immune activation. You got more toxicity. And so you would have thought this would have been an ideal combination. We should have seen great activity, a lot more response than you would have expected with just Nevo alone. Um, so this is now the five-year follow-up for the randomized trial of ipilimumab nivolumab versus nivolumab versus uh, ipilimumab in uh, melanoma. And there's some striking results here. 52% um, five-year survival for ipilimumab nivolumab, very similar to what we got in our phase one trial. The 36% progression-free survival rate for ipilimumab nivolumab at five years is amazing because that's probably a correlate of a complete response, which means that a third of patients, almost a third of patients, are probably cured of their cancer with this combination. But the key point that I want to make here is despite this, uh, you know, all of the biological activity that we saw, pharmacodynamic activity, um, the improvement over anti-PD-1 alone was only a very small amount. Uh, 
as, as you can see. And in fact, the survival differences here were not statistically significant. The progression-free survival was. So you have to ask the question then, well, you know, which groups of patients are responding to the anti-CTLA-4 because we're adding a lot of toxicity. And when you look at the forest plot and look at all the variables for what was looked at, really nothing comes through that's clearly statistically significant. There's some indication, well, if you live in Europe, you're going to do worse. There must be some biology to that. Uh, if, you, uh, if you're pd one negative, it looks like ipilimumab adds something to the, uh, um, to the combination, but that's, that's not statistically significant when you go across all variables. Um, so really, we don't know which subset of patients really benefit from the anti-CTLA-4, despite all of the activity. And later, I'm going to try and go back and tie this to the mechanism to show you again how difficult this all is in trying to develop rational therapies. Let me spend a moment on, on lung cancer for a moment. Um, so the other combination that seemed to show activity, there's three that have shown activity in phase three trials, is a combination of pembrolizumab and chemotherapy in non-small cell lung cancer. And what I show you here is the data from the uh, New England Journal of Medicine article showing you the activity for patients who are pd one less than 1%, which is the top one, 1 to 49%, which is the, the middle graph. And then the last one, the one at the bottom on the left-hand side, is 50% or greater, where pembrolizumab alone had already shown activity and improvement in survival over chemotherapy. So what these data suggested was that um, at least for the patients who were pd one negative or 1 to 49%, Pembrolizumab really did add, in combination with chemotherapy, really did, did add something uh, compared to chemotherapy alone. In the patients who were pd one high, it wasn't clear that adding pembrolizumab to chemotherapy did much more than what pembrolizumab did, did alone. This is all very early follow-up in, in this trial. So this combination worked. And one of the questions you could ask, and we'll address in a minute, is how did chemotherapy actually improve this response? What did it actually do that it added to the activity of of uh, pembrolizumab or vice versa to improve overall survival. So um, at ESMO, in just a couple of weeks ago, and just published in the New England Journal of Medicine, um, BMS just published a very large trial of nivolumab, ipilimumab versus chemotherapy in uh, non-small cell lung cancer. And um, if you look here, the, the graph on the left is the overall nevo ipi versus chemotherapy, which was statistically significant. The graph at the very top, this trial was a very complicated study. So in the patients who were pd one positive, which is the graph at the top, patients were randomized to get nevo ipi versus nevo alone versus chemotherapy. And if they were pd one negative, they got randomized to nevo ipi versus nevo chemotherapy versus chemotherapy. And um, what it suggests, again, is that nevo ipi is better than chemotherapy, regardless of pd one expression. It didn't really beat NEVO in the pd one positive group. It really looked very good in this sort of post hoc analysis in the pd one negative group. What's interesting here, and something that, that, that I think we should think about, is that the NEVO chemotherapy arm should be identical to Pembro chemotherapy, and it does look a little bit better. I don't think that was statistically significant like it was in the other trial. But you can see that the survival curve seemed to come together, and it's, it's part of my concern that combinations with chemotherapy may not be as effective in the long run as combinations with immunotherapy, because there might be some negative effect on long-term durable responses. But it gets even more complicated than that. Um, this is just to show you that the curves um, for NEVO um, uh, are very similar to the to the Pembroke trial, but we can actually skip this slide. So let's just look at the hazard ratios for a moment. So the, what was kind of interesting is that the nevo ipi effect was seen in patients who were pd one negative and the ones who were pd one greater than 50%. But if you look at the hazard ratio uh, for uh, the 1 to 49%, it's uh, 0.94. Um, that's also was also true for Pembro versus chemotherapy, but was not true for Pembro chemotherapy versus chemotherapy alone. So if you sort of put all these data together, um, <laughs> you, you, you sort of have three groups of patients, and how do you explain this? In the pdl one negative group, um, Pembro chemo and nevo ipi both look better than chemotherapy. nevo ipi probably is better than Pembro chemotherapy, but that's to be determined. In the 1 to 49% group, it looks like neither Pembro nor nevo ipi really do much compared to um, chemotherapy, but Pembro chemo, 
is better than chemotherapy. So in that group, chemotherapy plus anti-PD-1 does look better than the immunotherapies alone. And if you're pd one high, um, again, Nevo, Ipi, and Pembro probably are as good as Pembro chemotherapy uh, compared to chemotherapy alone. So I present all that data to show you how confusing this is and how do we develop biomarkers and how do we explain these results, right? Because um, I spent all weekend trying to figure out what these results meant and I could not figure out what the biology was. And I want to point out that it's not because, so is the IPI data real? And so they, in this lung cancer study, they gave like a whiff of ipilimumab, a milligram per kilogram every six weeks together with Nevo. And you would have expected that wouldn't have been very toxic, but in fact, the rate of grade three, four toxicity was around 30 to 35%, somewhere in that range, which is not dissimilar from when we give that, that same dose of IPI every three weeks with Nevo. So it, clearly the IPI was doing something biological in this study. So let me just spend a minute on, on mechanisms of action. So can we explain any of this with, by, by, by the mechanisms of action of CTLA-4? If you, if you look at what CTLA-4 does, it, it, you know, clearly it may have some intrinsic mechanism of action inhibiting T cells. Um, it clearly has a role in T regs. Um, when, um, um, when you give anti-CTLA-4, you probably expose CD80 and CD86, co-stimulatory molecules which may be necessary. Um, CTLA-4 can cause upregulation of IDO by, by dendritic cells. Cross-linking uh, CTLA-4 on Tregs can upregulate TGF-beta and IL-10. CTLA-4 affects the mobility of T cells. CTLA-4 does a lot of things, and CTLA-4 may be working in the lymph node, in the tumor draining lymph node, in the, the tertiary lymphoid structures. It could be working directly in the tumor microenvironment. Um, it could be something happening on Tregs or effector cells. It could be related to new antigen presentation or activation of memory cells. And it could be modifying high affinity or low affinity T cells. And the question is, for all of these effects, which ones are the ones that are important in any individual patient? And we really don't know. And so when we see that CTLA-4 works in some small subset of patients, we can't even tell which of these effects are the ones that are important. So if we can't figure that out, how are we going to be, develop biomarkers that would actually tell us who needs CTLA-4 and who, who won't? Um, and I just show this slide because this is data from an animal model that you can obviously uh, uh, get the results you want from any animal model. But this is Tom Gieski showing that um, using FTY720, which blocks egress of, of T cells, uh, from lymph nodes showing that, and if you look at just the last two, in an established tumor in a mouse model, if you give FTY720, you don't affect the anti-tumor activity of anti-CTLA-4 and anti-PD-1 very much, which at least in this animal model suggests that most of the action is occurring within the tumor microenvironment itself and that you don't need any T cells coming in from outside the tumor in order to get your anti-tumor activity, which actually con directly contradicts recent data that was uh, 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 resulted from uh, single cell sequencing from human tumor squamous cell carcinomas that were treated with anti-PD-1, the recently published data. So again, it becomes very confusing. Um, this is the last, these two slides, which I'll skip over because it's like, really just goes to show that at least in the animal models, it's very important to eliminate Tregs. That's what CTLA-4 seems to be doing. And if you don't eliminate Tregs, you lose a lot of the anti-tumor activity of anti-CTLA-4. So this is a long way of saying that CTLA-4 does a lot of things. It's clearly inactive. It's not as active as we would expect. And um, it, it's just, it, it, even though it's a very simple combination, we still can't actually figure out what it's doing. And when you start thinking about chemotherapy um, and trying to sort of trying to determine at least rationally who's going to respond and who's not and what sort of biology you're addressing when you add chemotherapy to anti-PD-1, there's a whole bunch of things that chemotherapy could be doing. Um, and I've listed them all here, and unfortunately, it's going to be very hard for us to know in any individual patient which of these effects are really critical. Are we just reducing tumor burden? Are we uh, getting rid of Tregs? Are we getting rid of MDSCs? Are we activating sting? Are we increasing uh, antigen presentation? And we just don't, don't know. Um, the only other combination here is the VEGF receptor combination with anti-PD-1 and renal cancer. Um, here again, we, we, we don't know the mechanism, although we can tie this more directly to some of the preclinical uh, studies. So um, I'm just going to take a moment and just say that what this tells us is that really we don't really have good biomarkers for uh, addressing the mechanisms of response or non-resistance in 
uh, patients who don't respond to anti-PD-1. What we're left with in the clinic is really developing these agents in patients who either we predict to have a low response to anti-PD-1 based on the biomarkers that we have or taking resistant patients. And um, that means that what we're doing in the clinic is very empiric. Um, and we can make mistakes. This is um, uh, uh, a trial of uh, pembrolizumab plus or minus an IDO inhibitor in melanoma based on very good phase two data. When it went to phase three, you couldn't put a piece of paper between those curves, and we still don't really understand why this trial uh, failed. So um, again, going back here, the, the, the really sort of uh, major block in, in clinical development of these agents is that we, we, we're getting better at biomarkers that can tell us who will and won't respond to anti-PD-1, but we really don't have that second biomarker for what you need to add to the non-responders in order to improve the survival uh, curves. Um, I want to just say one thing about developing agents in PD-1 uh, non-responders. Um, not all non-responders are truly non-responders. Um, they are patients who have pseudoprogression, and so when you look at the data from those trials, if you have a very low signal of activity, some of that may or may not be related to the drug that you're adding to anti-PD-1. So if you've had a short duration of anti-PD-1 therapy, if you've been on anti-PD-1 for a very short period of time, um, those patients who then go on to another drug might have responded to PD-1 late. For patients who have been on anti-PD-1 and responded and then go off drug, a lot of those patients, especially in melanoma, if you wait long enough, can respond again to anti-PD-1 when they relapse. So if you're including those patients in your trials and you're claiming activity of your agent, that might not be a, a, a signal from the agent that you're giving. And not all progression is the same in the clinic. So um, if you have multiple non-nodal sites of disease that are growing, that's probably true progression. But if you have oligoclonal progression, that doesn't really mean that the patient is resistant. They may be resistant in those sites, but you can take care of those uh, individual growing lesions with surgery or radiation and may still get a very good outcome. And so if you're looking at survival in that setting, your drug may not really be affecting survival. And if you only have nodal-only progression, um, we see that all the time in the clinic, and that's not true progression. That's just inflammatory response. So the SITC is trying to develop a paper, so to more uh, traditional guidelines, more uniform guidelines for entry of patients into uh, the PD-1 non-responder uh, trial so that at least if you do see a response in a signal, you're pretty sure that it's due to the drug and not just to a late effect of anti-PD-1 or a re-response to anti-PD-1. And just to show you that um, oligoclonal progression um, can be misleading, this is data from uh, 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 Nick Clemens here at, at Yale. He's a surgeon. He went back and looked at all of our uh, data in melanoma um, over the last 10 years with uh, either anti-PD-1, anti-CTLA-4, or the combination. And he basically looked at the patients who had oligoclonal progression that we then sent to surgery. So these are patients who either had a single progressing site um, or a single residual site of disease, or patients where only one site of disease was progressing and the rest of the disease was stable. And if you look on the right-hand side of this curve, you can see that for the patients that did go on to surgery, they had outstanding outcomes. Many of them were progression-free for quite a number, period of time after the surgery. And if you look at the survival of these patients who would have been considered progressors, they had outstanding survival. So if those patients were to go on to a PD-1 resistance trial and you were going to look at survival, you'd be fooled because those patients would have done well regardless of, um, of, any, of, of treatment. Um, so I'm going to spend the last minute just going through um, just a few strategies. This is, if I were to guess what was going to work in the clinic, um, this would be my top four choices. Um, I think there's probably going to be something in reactivating uh, exhausted or dysfunctional pools, and there may be ways of doing that. Not all the T cells are trash, but they may not all be responsive to anti-PD-1, and maybe cytokines like Aaron's, IL-18, DR, or maybe combinations of other checkpoints might reactivate those cells. Um, it may be necessary in some patients to give them new T cells, uh, new antigen specific TCRs, and you may be able to do that either by immunization, plus or minus CTLA-4. Um, Steve Rosenberg is actually taking TCRs from Tregs, which are not the same as the TCRs in effector cells, putting them back into naive T cells and giving those back. And there are people who are basically taking modified TCRs against shared antigens and giving those back and seeing responses. 
there are novel checkpoints like Liping, Siglet 15, and then the other thing that I think might be very fruitful in the clinic would be things that are non-T-cell dependent, so things that target intertumoral macrophages. You saw from data that was presented earlier from Marcus that many of the cells within the tumor microenvironment are macrophages, and I'll show you a little bit of data with CD40, just one or two anecdotes to suggest that that might be a productive uh, strategy. Um, so um, CD40 is very interesting. Um, um, it's a um, TNF-like receptor on uh, dendritic cells, monocytes, macrophages, and B cells. Some years ago, um, Bob Vonderheide did a trial of anti-CD40 and actually showed single agent activity in, in melanoma. There were four responders out of 15. There was a second trial where it was given too often and not active. It was basically dropped. And then Marcus and Sue started looking at, at CD40 here and showed activity in first in Marcus's model and then in combination with uh, CSF1R. And then Harriet and uh, uh, Kluger and Sarah Weiss here uh, had the opportunity to participate in a trial of anti-CD40 and nivolumab in patients who were non-responsive to uh, anti-PD-1 alone or had progressed on anti-PD-1. And, you know, our initial experience with this is really quite interesting because we've treated about 12 patients and now we have already, I think, almost four, we have four responders. I don't know what the entire database is, but the, this is a real drug. And this is one of my patients that had uh, mucosal melanoma, had ipinevo, had maybe a little bit of response, went on anti-PD-1, and after several months had progression in multiple sites of disease. She might have responded to ipinevo again, but it's unlikely. We gave her anti-CD40 and anti-PD-1, and within eight weeks she had an amazing response. She had responses in the liver. This is one of the liver responses. This mesenteric mass that you see over here, um, it's, I'd have to point the pointer, but it's over on the... Uh, on the right side of the abdomen, completely disappeared. And she's uh, progression-free now at a year. And this is, as I said, one of three or four responders that we have now. Not everybody responds, but this is a real drug. There's a responder in lung cancer. And um, based in part on this work and some of the work that was done with the combination of anti-CD40 and CSF1R um, by Marcus and Sue, um, uh, Harriet and uh, Sarah started a phase one trial of the triple combination of uh, an anti-CD40 uh, uh, agonist, uh, Kabira, which is an antibody against CSF1R, and Nevo. We've gone through the phase one. It has significant toxicity and started the phase two in, in melanoma, but uh, Harriet just told me that we had a responder recently. And so we don't really know how much a CSF1R adds to this, but again, it's, it's an approach that I think might be interesting. And what's interesting about this is that some of the activity of this combination, which is specifically targeting macrophages, is non-T-cell dependent in the, uh, in the mouse models. There are other strategies that are very interesting. The um, reason why I show this slide is the scientist Valerie Oldegaard actually did her PhD in immunobiology here at Yale. Um, has developed an antibody with a small molecule, TLR8, um, as a payload on this antibody. When, when you give this and it binds to macrophages in the tumor microenvironment, it has to bind to its antigen and then gets internalized into the macrophages through an FC-dependent mechanism, carries a TLR8 uh, agonist into the tumor, and, and basically induces substantial activation of those macrophages. And in early animal models, she's seen amazing activity that's both T cell dependent and independent. So this is a strategy that I think would be very interesting if you have a, a fairly specific uh, tumor target for the antibody. And then the last thing that, that I just want to talk about are, 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 uh, is adoptive immunotherapy. Um, this is another way of getting T cells into the tumor microenvironment. Um, Steve Rosenberg had shown activity of TIL some years ago in a small company, developed a, a methodology for making these in a commercially viable way. Um, this is the data that they presented on one of the cohorts we've participated in this trial. Um, this is better data than we've seen in our own hands, but um, uh, of these patients, and it's a, it's a significant uh, uh, size cohort, um, almost all had had um, anti-CTLA-4, all had had anti-PD-1, the objective response rate was 38%. Now, maybe these are the same patients that might respond to CD40 in Nevo, in Vivo, I don't know, but the, uh, the response rate with TIL therapy is very significant, and it may be that adoptive immunotherapy may be necessary in a subset. Um, obviously, they would have to have antigen-specific T cells in their tumor microenvironment, but perhaps you need to take them out of the body and reactivate them and give them back in order to see activity. And at ESMO, um, uh, this is also quite interesting because this is an affinity-modified TCR against uh, 
MAJ4, it's uh, uh, transfected into peripheral blood lymphocytes and given back, and in synovial sarcoma, a uh, fairly large percentage of the patients actually had activity. So this may be another way of maybe delivering new TCRs into the tumor microenvironment, plus or minus anti-PD-1, in order to get anti-tumor effects. So um, in summary, um, um, I, I think that, that clinical development is really quite complicated because we, we, we just don't have um, good biomarkers for what that second agent should be together with anti-PD-1. And what makes it even more complicated is that the agents that we give have multiple mechanisms of action. So actually trying to identify the mechanism that, you're needing to, that you need to address in vivo is complicated. And it's even more complicated when you realize that not all the T cells in the tumor microenvironment are doing the same thing or would be functional. Um, I think that, that there are um, rational approaches in T cell failure. Uh, or rational approaches in T cell failure require really a more comprehensive understanding of what the critical signals are for activation of those diverse T cell subsets, or we need to make new TCRs. And um, probably, although I don't think we've, we're actually at the ceiling of things that, 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 would, be meet, that would work by uh, T cell mechanisms, we really need to focus a lot more on non-T cell dependent mechanisms. There's a bunch of tumors out there that just don't have antigens. We'll lose MHC class one. And I think that's where the real major opportunity is over the next several years. So I'll stop there. Thank you for your attention. I apologize for keeping you late on a, on a Friday afternoon and happy to answer questions uh, probably afterwards if, uh, if you have any. We got the president of Sitsi up here. We can ask him a question or two. Mar uh, leaping. So Mario, the uh, I actually get c completely confused. The uh, after your <laughs> after your talk. The uh, so the let me ask you a question. What is the general philosophy or the logic behind this combo or, or selection of combo? I mean, is the now I look the overall the the feel is like you have a PD one which worked and then and then plus plus anything, okay? So that's one way, right? But the a anything else, which is not even show single agent activity, most of them are not, right? Right. And then just keep a combo. So then, but I agree, which could be microenvironment or entire immune system is could be multi inhibitor, multi problems. So combo makes sense in that way. But how do you know which to, to combo? I mean, it's just, you cannot just keep adding number, right? Like, like one, like later would be triple or four or five different combos. I mean, that's, that's, that's the point I was making is that you don't know. You, you, there's no way to know. There's no way to know what signal you need to give. So even if you have T cells in the microenvironment, let's say there are T cells there and you don't respond to PD-1, how do you know whether you need to give um, another checkpoint inhibitor, a co-stimulatory molecule, cytokine, um, how do you know what, what signal you need to drive that into some threshold for anti-tumor response? And you, maybe even some of those signals are redundant and non-critical, right? So some of them may be even in the same pathway. So given the complexity of the microenvironment, the, there, at, at least at this point, I don't know how you would know which of those different approaches you would take in order to convert that into a responder. Right, but I saw was the I saw was the uh, at least you you combine two agent or three agent which they at least work as a single agent, right? So then by that way you at least get additive effect, or, or could could get additive effect, well potentially maybe synergistic effect. Then so, that would be ideal, but at least additive effect because the different mechanism maybe at least they you know they can work as one plus two. Equal, equal to three. Or so, so I agree. There's a couple of ways to thinking about doing this. One is to um, to say I'm just going to combine active agents and that work by different mechanisms. Or the other way to do it would be to say to try and guess what what critical non-redundant signals are necessary in the microenvironment. You could say, well, CD40 is probably a really important signal, right? Because it activates DCs, it activates macrophages, it upregulates class one, it upregulates CD80, CD86, you get upregulation of IL-12. You could say, all of those things are really nifty and it should work. And I'm gonna combine it with, uh, with anti-PD-1. But you don't know up front which patients need that, or if any, in your, two, in your, in your, your, your phase two trial.
Right, so the, if the single agent don't work, that would mean the, this mechanism might not be significant in, in most of the patient, right? That's and a major argument in the field. If, right, if, if the single agent doesn't work, would it still be worth combining? So you can make that argument for, so what if, what if you needed um, um, T cells, there are no T cells, you need it to prime. Well, a vaccine by itself probably won't have any activity, right. but it may be that for the vaccine, you may need to give CTLA-4 and maybe even anti-PD-1 in order to see optimal effects. But the vaccine itself wouldn't, may not have any activity because there's so many signals that you need downstream in order to make that work. Yeah, but that's bad, though, because that you, you, have no, you don't really know how to combine. Then I can see that they, then the, in the future, are you looking at for, are you looking for combine like three, four, five, seven, eight different agents to, to be future? I mean... That's, that is the, I, I, I don't know. That's the problem is that I don't know. I, I, All right. so. um, totally brilliant, Mario. Um, so everybody join me in thanking him and I'm going to...